Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 247. The sound and music are 50% of the entertainment in a movie. George Lucas. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Now, guys, today we're going to talk about something that we have not discussed in over 246 episodes of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. We are going to talk about audio and how to do audio properly, how to record audio properly, tips and the tricks of how to do it cheaply, what to expect in post-production, what is the post-production process of audio, the whole gambit. It's going to be a mini masterclass on the audio process when dealing in feature films. Now, today on the show, we have Matt Davies and Rich Bussey. Now, these guys are from Studio Unknown, as if you might recognize the name. Studio Unknown has been a sponsor of the show for uh, for about three or four months now. And uh, so, full disclosure, they are a sponsor of the show. Uh, they have paid to, uh, to uh, be on the show as an advertiser, but I wanted to bring them on as a guest because of the valuable information that they have in regards to audio. Now, I am a self-proclaimed audioit or audio, uh, audio idiot. Uh, I don't like audio. I've never liked the process of it. Um, I love what happens when I work with someone who knows what they're doing, but me personally, I can't stand doing it. It is one of the tools I did not put in my toolbox purely because I just don't like it. But it is extremely important and you need to understand the power of what can and cannot be done in post-production. The audience will forgive bad picture, but it will not forgive bad audio. You could have a horrible looking movie and it has to sound great. It's just something in human DNA that we just don't like bad audio, but we'll take bad picture. Look at a movie like Blair Witch Project or, you know, or Paranormal Activity, which is all these kind of just like lowbrow um, cameras, you know, low end cameras that they were using in many ways. Uh, and it was not visually that stimulating, but the audio was amazing. And that those two movies became huge hits because of it. So understanding audio is such a very big deal in regards to what we do as filmmakers and as storytellers. So sit back, relax, and get ready to take notes and enjoy my conversation with Matt Davies and Rich Bussey from Studio Unknown. Thank you so much for coming on. These guys are from Studio Unknown, which you have heard their name a little bit over the course of the last few months on the podcast, but I wanted to get them on the show to talk all things audio because we have yet, in 240 plus episodes, have never had an audio episode. And it's such so, so important. So thank you guys for coming on. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Alex. So first of all, how did you guys get into the business? Uh, do you want to go first? Sure. So it was kind of a roundabout way that I actually got into doing audio post and all the things that I do within it. I think I was always into films growing up, but I wanted to be a creature designer and prosthetics builder and get into the, the this kind of, kind of sculptural element of the filmmaking process. So I was big into sci-fi and creatures. And, and then in high school, I started to get into music, you know, I was playing bass a lot and these kind of two forks appeared and it was either going the music route or going the sculptural route. And I ended up going the sculptural route. And after I got into um, to art school to do that and started to get into the art world more, for doing sculpture, I quickly discovered that it wasn't 
the right path for me because I was so film focused and film minded. Mm -hmm. And so shortly after that, I just plunged straight into doing sound and uh, started to become the, the sound guy in the class. My college didn't offer that many sound courses at the time, so I kind of had to create a bit of my own curriculum. Because of the sculptural background, I started to discover things like sculpture, and I started to build more things. And so it ended up coming back and then did production sound for a while because those quite often can be the easier gigs to get when you're green and you're trying to work your way up in the industry. You know, it's PA gigs and then mm -hmm. eventually production sound, booming, recording, stuff like that. And then eventually hit another fork where I was like, okay, I can either – continue to invest in my kit and continue to do production sound, or I can try to leap for the dream and get into doing post-production where I wanted to be able to express creative ideas and build worlds and have this kind of blank canvas at my disposal. And so I, I jumped into that. Then it just kind of took off from there. I just found myself being busy all the time, joined the studio shortly after, and then have been there, uh, been there ever since. So it evolved, but it's funny because it all kind of goes back to the original stuff. It goes back to being a sculptor, being into creatures, being into, you know, music and film. So it all uh, is significant, I think. Very cool. How about you, Rich? Yeah, so let's see. Also very much into film at a young age and also found my way into music around middle school when I got my first guitar and was in various bands for school and outside of school uh, in my high school years. And I decided to pursue music at the university level. So I took music technology, which focuses on both music and the recording arts. And in that time, part of the requirements are two internships. And one of my internships was here at Studio Unknown. So that was kind of that was back in 2010, 2011. So that was my first eye opening experience in terms of sound and its use within film. And it's actually pretty common within the industry for uh, a lot of people working in post sound to have a bit of a music background. That mm -hmm. that is pretty yeah, I think common. You, you, I think you find that more you find that more than people just going down this path of studying sound design and then going into sound design. And I think that's actually great because it really you have to establish a, a wider skill set and. You know, mm -hmm. problem solving, I think, is a lot more common in music creation and production early on. Yeah, for sure. And so there was there was almost a level of self-consciousness, I felt, at some point with, you know, listening to some of the great re-recording mixers or sound designers talking about how they got into the position that they're in now, where a lot of them came from music backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, God, did I, did I like, miss a step or something? <laughs> like, what, you know, what happened? But. It's. I think it's about how you seek out the knowledge and how you use it. But yeah, it's it's a that's an amazing place to start from. Yeah. So I completed my internship here at Studio Unknown, and then did a number of other internships uh, in various other aspects of the world of audio. I was at the the Kennedy Center, Sirius XM, various other places, and I kept coming back to thinking about Studio Unknown and how much I really loved the world of post sound. And I wouldn't have known that that's where I wanted to land uh, in my case if I hadn't have tried various other avenues as well. So I'm glad I was able to hone that in. I did a bunch of live sound for two or three years right out of college, but kept in touch with Matt and these guys here. Mm -hmm. And as they continued to get busy, they bring me on to do some freelance editing work, some field recording trips and got busy enough to bring me in three days a week, three days turned to four, four turned to five. And well, now, now we're here seven days a week sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah. The wonderful world of post-production. Yeah. <laughs> like, hope you like nights and weekends. Yeah, exactly. I actually went to um, full sale for, oh, uh, yeah. for my college days and they, they would actually have classes between 12 and four o'clock in the morning. Uh, and their oh, wow. their excuse was to prepare us for the industry, but the reality was that they were renting out the <laughs> the, the, the suites during the day. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. We we have a couple buddies uh, who came out of full sale. I hadn't heard this story yet about classes going to four a.m. That, that, that's that is yeah. such a such a fantastic, convenient 
thing for everybody, I think, because that is so right. like, that's the dreaded thing is like, oh man, when I start out, I'm going to be like night shift crew and mm-hmm. stuff. How am I going to like change my schedule? And that just prepares you so well. It, it does. Was a, it it does. Yeah, it was a similar thing, not not that intense, but you know, I, I went to art school, and so they have studio classes that are about six hours, mm-hmm. and so you're you're often going late, and then you need to continue working, and it definitely instills in you that it's like this isn't going to be a quick process, like it's going to be dense, but it's like you have to like hunker down and like commit to it and everything. It's so, the ma- it's the marathon, not the sprint. Yeah, it's the marathon yeah. for sure. So. You know, a lot of a lot of filmmakers that I've ever talked to, and, and I've been in post for twenty odd years, uh, not in the audio sense, but in the visual side. And audio is always the like redheaded stepchild of <laughs> of you know. I hope no one's redheaded here, but uh, <laughs> but no, but seriously, it's like it's like the stepchild of of post because not even of post of production because it's like the last thing they think about. They're like, oh well, you know, we'll get somebody to hold the boom. And, you know, we'll get it into the Mackie and, uh, and, and we're out the door, um, or a task cam. And I did do that for one movie, but I did have some, some skills to do it with. And I did talk to my audio post guys before I did it. But generally speaking, um, guys, you know, people don't take a lot of time recording good location sounds. Do you have any tips for filmmakers out there on how to record good location sound if you don't have a, pro mixer on set or someone who knows audio on set just some basic tips obviously the biggest tip is to hire a real location guy yeah, uh, yeah. to do it but if you don't what are some tips you think you can help them out with yeah so there's there's a lot i mean that's a loaded question of course like it is. for to start yeah <laughs> um but the number one thing that is important to have above kind of all else is attention putting attention on it and importance on it to be aware of kind of what's what's needed from your crew while you're filming your attentiveness as a director to to put your ears on the sound and make priorities for the shooting location to make sure that you are doing everything you can to allow the recording to go properly so like all the the best equipment in the world isn't worth anything if you don't allow the environment to be good for recording sound Mm -hmm. So a less like, you know, abstract answer to that is that we're in a really great time where there's lots of cost effective solutions to get better production sound than just just using the camera mic or just using these things. Yeah, God God forbid, which we hear we hear sometimes on professional projects. And it's like, what happened, guys? Like, (laughs) what happened? You you, you spent five hundred thousand dollars on the camera. Could you just not throw a couple bucks to the audio guy? Seriously. And it really, it really has kind of gotten to that state, but thankfully, you know, companies like zoom Mm -hmm. have really, I think about sometimes when I was in production sound if zoom had been who they are now. And I don't know that I would have maybe gotten into post-production because they're so cost effective and they do such a good job that you can really kind of increase the level of quality for your production. So one of the biggest things is, is making sure that you can have control over that sound. So if you're buying if you're buying something like a Zoom recorder, even like an H6 or mm-hmm. one of the smaller ones that has XLR inputs, making sure that you have separation of your cast members or your subjects so that you can control those better. And then in post, you'll be able to control their different channels. You will you can separate them if you need to use a different source. You can do that. You know, it's fairly cost effective. I mean, Rode and Zoom both have lower budget, you know, solutions for lavalier mics. Yep. Yep. And then beyond that, it's like, all kinds of little things, making sure that you, when you're rolling, that you're listening to the environment and that you wait for things like planes to come over. A oh, lot of things, yeah. like, like I kind of getting back to the first point that I made, it's all about listening to your environment. And so waiting until the time is right to start rolling can often be the deal breaker in a lot of this stuff. So wait until the plane goes by, wait until the motorbike stops idling at a, the traffic light across the street. If you're shooting in a restaurant location, see if you can talk to the management about turning the music off for your shoot. Like we've heard that. Because <laughs> then it's like, well, I know we it sounds crazy, but it's, it's so true. It's so, it does, so yeah. true. I would say that it happens a little bit more for documentary work than it does for narrative fiction. But it ends up being that conversation of, well, why? So we can't use this entire clip now or this entire scene because there's a very well-known song in the background. 
And it's like, yeah, so we're going to have to replace the whole thing. And that's, that's something that would have, you know, should have been discussed kind of upfront or made aware of. I mean, I think when you're in the heat and I, I'll speak for myself as, you know, from being in production, when you're in the heat of the moment and you've yeah. got all the actors waiting and you've got all the crew waiting and we're going to be doing this big dolly move. And then the sound guy goes, hold. And everyone's just like, God damn it. Because it's something that you can't see. And he's the only one hearing it. He's like, no, wait a minute. That refrigerator, hold on. We got cut it and we got to go back to, you know, because a good sound guy will do that for you. But when you're in the heat of the moment, inexperienced people will just go, screw it. We'll just fix it in post, which is the worst thing you could ever say. Yeah. Um, especially audio. I have seen though, even in recent, you know, years, the miracles that can be done in post, uh, in sure. audio post. I mean, there is some stuff that blew my mind that you can do, but yet, and that still costs money though. It's much yeah. cheaper just to get good audio. That's the, I mean, you, you said it perfectly. It's, it is much cheaper to just get good audio. You know, I think that there are a lot of cynics and skeptics out there that are like, well, you know, that's expensive. I don't I didn't have the money to pay for a good production sound person. But it becomes about like being able to look at the budget that you do have and figure out how you're going to be able to use that budget from day one to have a good outcome through the rest of your process. And, man, there's been a number of films where we've gotten just the most terrible production sound and then we're finding ourselves in a don't shoot the messenger situation oh, oh, where yeah. at the end we're like, uh, Hey, we're going to have to like ADR your whole film. Right. Yes. And, yes. I've been you in know, those you, meetings. <laughs> and it's usually, yeah. And the, the worst part about it is typically those conversations happen on in the worst possible scenarios where it's like maybe with child actors too, who, oh. who now sound like different people, yep. you know, it's yep. like the Terminator two story. Of yeah. Edward Perlong, yeah. And it's like, so we'll have to figure out ways of like making them sound younger by, you know, a, a year it. or so yeah, yeah. Pitching, yeah. It. pitching it or ADR performances. Sometimes that that's happened to us in, in the past too. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's just that kind of level of attentiveness. Do it right the first time, you know? And, and then, yeah, no, no, I was going to say that. I think that film goers will excuse and forgive bad picture, but they yes. don't generally forgive bad audio. That's that's yeah, correct. For sure. And uh, another point that you brought up that, yes, while we have the tools to fix a number of these problems, if you're coming into post already with a tight budget, mm -hmm. um, fixing these problems takes time. And we'd much rather put the budget that you do have towards creative additive sound because right. your productions. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a really um, I think Randy Tom talked about that at, at some point was the importance of okay, so we can either roll with your bad production sound and be completely, you're at the kind of the beck and call of whatever the quality of the production sound is. So if the, if there's a terrible noise floor behind your dialogue, welcome to how your creative backgrounds and effects are going to need to kind of sound and, and blend. Mm -hmm. um, so you're really forcing your creative hand and for very creative independent filmmakers, that's really challenging because you're, you find yourself in a, in a hard position where it's like, Hey, you know, you wanted this, you wanted this scene to be super delicate and really quiet and intimate, but like there's a drag race happening next door. Like, right. <laughs> you know, we can't, or, you know, Sumba class or something happening. So, right. Yeah. It's definitely a challenge, but you know, one of the biggest things that we talk about whenever we get onto, onto a film closer to pre-production, we have the opportunity to talk to people about their production. What's going to happen in production is, you know, doing things like reading scripts or shooting scripts and determining like, Okay, so you're talking about being, you know, in a big outdoor area or near some train tracks here. Well, you know, you're going to come across those problems. So make sure that you have labs on everybody, wireless lavaliers on everybody. And you have a really competent boom op that can swing and, and get in there if, if a coat makes some unfortunate rustle on a on a lab track. So it's preparedness just being like on top of it as much as you're on top of anything else. I think well, that's so good. Which brings us to our next question. Lavalier or boom, Mike, what would, if you had to choose, obviously both would be ideal, but if you had to choose, which way would you go? I think most people will typically pick boom mm -hmm. if the boom track is great. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of reasons for that, which is mainly that you tend to have the most natural sound capture from a non-lavalier microphone like a boom. 
-hmm. It captures more of the air. It captures more of the perspective. If you have a boom op that's getting in kind of as tight as they can based on how wide the, you know, shot, how, how wide the shot is, then you can end up with this great natural perspective from shot to shot. And that's kind of perfect for us. And then that same thing follows through to Foley and effects that you end up really establishing the sound for your film early on. That being said, just because environments are hard to control, lavaliers are equally important to get right as much of the time. I think a lot of the time they can be considered backup for the boom. I say that because doing so many films where the lavalier is hidden under several layers of clothing. Right. And it's like, if you knew that you were doing that, would you continue to go through the trouble of recording it if, if it's not going to be usable? So often I, I feel like it's used as a bit of a backup, but there have been a couple of films where I've even had a little bit of my own philosophy challenged on it because it is very easy to say, oh man, booms, you know, shotgun mic or, or a cardioid. Yeah, they will always sound better. And saying better is kind of a matter of perspective. There's been a couple of films that I've worked on where the director has asked me if we can switch back to using the laugh track because it has a more intimate sound. And so it right. really raises this question of, okay, so what are you looking for in the sound of that dialogue recording? And they wanted to hear more of the unnatural details. They wanted to hear a little bit more of the sound pressure on the lavalier mic capsule that made it feel maybe a little bit more uncomfortable, a little bit more unnatural so that you actually were paying maybe more attention to that voice than you would have otherwise. So I think it's about trying to use both of them, understanding where each one excels um, and then <laughs> trying to make the conditions the best so that you can, it becomes more of a creative decision in the end of like right. what works better creatively and emotionally for this film, the laugh or the boom, instead of like, well, the lavalier signal failed and got some RF interference, so we can't use that. So now we're stuck with, you know, it's, right. it's, uh, it's very kind of different sides. I think. Yeah. Would, would you also agree guys that it doesn't matter if you have a $10,000 microphone or a hundred dollar microphone, if you don't put it as close as humanly possible to the subject, it doesn't matter how good the mic is. I think that's one of the biggest tips I discovered when I started to do my own audio on, on my first feature was just get it really close. And a $250 road mic does an amazing job. You know, it's really amazing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's one note in there that I think is something worth addressing, which is about, it's not so much as close as possible. It's, as close as you need to be. Right. Um, and so, uh, and what I mean by that is, is that, and this, this applies to just about all audio recording with microphones is that there's an optimal space where you can get the most natural sounding recording to capture as truly as you can the subject before it starts getting unnatural or starts getting, you know, proximity effect or anything else like that. And so what's hard is that, yeah, it's, it goes back to that kind of I think the same thing can happen for cameras too. You know, a skilled, a skilled person with a cheap camera yep. can do a better job than an inexperienced person with a $50,000 camera. And so it's really about learning how they function and the, you know, I think learning the downsides to the product that you have is great. Like learning the limitations of a cheap mic sure. will make you increase your chances of being successful with it because you can roll into and lean into those deficiencies maybe with the product to get something good out of it. I have a really cheap guitar, a 12 string bass guitar in my room. And it's a, it, as an instrument, it is a terrible instrument. <laughs> it's, it's noisy. It's like things have, things have just broken over the years. And what I figured out at some point is that it shines under certain circumstances and played a certain way or manipulated a certain way. And I think the same that applies to a lot of things and especially microphones like, OK, I know the limitations of this. So, yeah. yeah. And I, I think it somewhat applies to what you alluded to earlier, Alex, in that someone might spend this excessive amount of money on like red cameras, but then mm -hmm. have exhausted all of their budget and will now have to buy cheaper microphones, if, if any at all. Mm -hmm. And it might be a much better approach to buy everything more proportionally. Yeah. So you're no longer 
pairing this pristine, perfect image with prosumer level audio gear. And right. It, it makes no sense. You're absolutely right. It makes absolutely no sense. But the mentality for a lot of filmmakers, and it's, you know, this gear porn kind of mentality where the camera is sexy for, yeah. for a filmmaker. The mics are not. And it's, and it's just the way filmmakers work and they think about it because they could see the visuals and, but they, you know, hearing it crisp and clean is not nearly as sexy as looking at a beautiful Alexa image, you know, or a black magic image or a red image. Um, so it's something I think that needs to be reprogrammed in filmmakers, uh, minds a bit that like you got to understand how to get good audio. If you're not hiring a professional to do it, I mean, Really do your research and do it because if not, it's going to be really difficult to sell your movie or finish yeah. it. Yeah, and I think what you brought up about the quote-unquote sexiness of equipment is great. I mean, we, we've joked a lot. I've joked with a lot of other sound people about if a film crew is like a band, like who are the different roles? And quite often the camera op with the camera is the lead guitarist. You know, they're, oh, yeah. they're doing the solos. They're up front. They, they mm -hmm. get, you know, on the front of magazines and then – Sound guides are typically like the bass player. You know, they get dragged on by everybody. It's like just you know, follow the drummer, or whatever. I could, could, it could honestly sometimes they're the roadies. Let's just be honest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, and you do see that happen on production sets yeah. where it's like, hey, grab the PA and you know, hold this boom. You know, yes, yes. And it's yes. like, it's like, oh man, that's why you're coming to me in post with like, you know, oh maybe they did a great job. That's awesome. But most of the time, it's like, oh yeah, we. uh we didn't actually ever have a sound person. We just gave it to whoever was available. Right. So, and it's just like, oh, you know. And, they, and the budget of the movie was $250,000. And you're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Going back to the more kind of technical question, I think that, you know, yeah, like Rich said, having your production budget for your equipment and just kind of saying like, okay, let's, let's try and tailor things back a little bit in this section so that we can maybe up the quality of that. Because everybody agrees that, Investment-wise, microphones are just about the best investing that you can do in any audio technology because if you buy a good one, it'll last forever. And it's like nobody – It's like lenses. Yeah, exactly, lenses. But nobody says that about camera bodies. No. no right? No. So just, it's the same – crazy to buy camera bodies. <laughs> yeah. So it's great at this point now because you can buy a good-sounding recorder that will record the sound files properly and then – put your money towards getting a, a nicer mic, like a, you know, Sennheiser 416 that is like a hammer. I mean, it's like you can build a house with that thing. In, it'll in just any keep kind going. of weather. Yeah. yeah. I, so I think that's that, that kind of proportioning of budget that's so important is like really you want to try to treat everything somewhat equally or be prepared to like have to tip the scale later on in the process. Because like you said, people will notice the differences if the sound is bad and they don't care how good i mean b movies right this is my go-to for everything b movies are the classic example of why sound is important if you take like all the really bad sci-fi sharknado, from, sharknado. The, well even I, I would i mean i think movies like sharknado have the capacity to sound pretty good based on modern technology but if what? you go back to like the 50s oh god yeah like right so flying saucer movies and stuff like that I mean, these sets, even Star Trek, early Star Trek episodes, you know, these boulders are made out of styrofoam. Right. You know, what do you think makes them sound heavy? It's the actor's physical performance paired with the sound effect of, of a, a large, deep impact falling. And that's what makes the marriage. And the same thing still holds true. It's like something's filmed on a soundstage and you need that sound design and all the other elements to convince the audience that it's all real. Which brings me to my next question. Foley which is an art form in itself. Can you discuss what Foley is for the audience and how important it is in a current mix in today's world? Yeah, so Foley and Foley art is the act of performing a physical action recorded against picture and performed against picture. So the Foley artist will watch the image and whether you're doing footsteps, whether you're doing something with props or an action, we'll watch the character or subject's performance on screen and then mimic what they're doing to recreate a sound. And that's all, not always literal mimicking. It's just moving in a way to cinematically recreate the sound that they would have been generating had that sound been recorded on production. So in an, you know, in an ideal world, 
your set is quiet all the time and all of those amazing details that happen because of the actor's actions get picked up. But it doesn't work like that because the attention is on getting the dialogue recorded properly. So there's a very small percentage of the actual sound that we get from production that are effects like footsteps and things like doors that are highly usable. And we call those production effects. But but generally, whole, you, but, but generally you – even when you have those production sounds, if there's a budget – and generally, you ask for a little bit. You replace those sounds with something that's going to a little bit meatier, like a door closing or those footsteps or a punch for an instant. Obviously, a punch, but things that were in production, you will replace them or enhance production sound to give it a little bit more weight. Correct? Yeah, correct. Nine times out of ten, it's enhancing. Right. So it's blending between the two of them to go. You know what? The footsteps in this sound pretty good, but you know what? We can't hear the leather jacket. Um, and so let's, let's try to enhance this character more, or we use the production sound in a later scene as reference to go like, you know what? I know we can't see his feet in this scene, but he was in a similar part of the house here. So we can assume that maybe it's carpet as well. And then we know how to do carpeted footsteps for which scenes of the film, for example. So in the process of doing Foley art, unlike sound effects, unlike a lot of editing where it's a single person operation, um, and you have as you know many people as you need editing different aspects with Foley art. It's typically a two person operation. It's not just the Foley artist. It's also the Foley recorded slash mixer. And in a lot of ways, the Foley recordist slash mixer is acting more for the ears of the film than the Foley artist sometimes is because they're hearing how it's getting recorded and how it's translating into the software, which can make or break a performance. So in my relationship with rich, I'm the Foley artist here Mm -hmm. And Rich is the Foley mixer. So it's very important that we're constantly communicating, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Based on perspective, so Matt will be performing and hearing his performance through his ears, naturally, and I'll be hearing it through the perspective of the placement of the microphone. So very frequently telling him, hey, you need to back up a little bit more or come a little bit closer. And uh, the way we're situated, actually, is that I can't see much more than Matt's head, actually. Hmm. Often, I'm not sure what props he's using to recreate the sounds that we're trying to put into the film, which I've come to embrace because if I know, oh, you're using a leather baseball glove for the sound of those leather pants, then when I'm recording it and watching it against picture, it might taint the way I'm interpreting the sound. And if I can't see the prop Hmm. and I'm just purely just listening to the sound itself, then I can more accurately let Matt know, yes, that's tracking well, or no, it's not. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest reasons actually why, although we love filmmakers visiting the Foley stage, and we do a good amount of behind the scenes recording, recording some of the Foley stuff that we do to put it up online, it's usually a bad idea to have the filmmakers viewing the actual Foley session for their film. Oh, yeah. Because it's it's really hard to fight the urge to go like, are, are, you, are you sure that's going to work? And then they're going to picture that all the way through till mix. They're going to be like, maybe if you didn't use the thing that you used, it wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so it's a very psychological kind of exercise there. But it's really, you know, the setup, at least that Rich and I have allows for that, which is fantastic. But the whole like translation side of things with the microphone is important, too, because, you know, body pats are a really simple thing, for example, like somebody Let's say two people are giving each other a hug and they're patting each other on the back. Well, we can all imagine what that sound sounds like, but there's a sweet spot for the microphone based on where your hand is patting on your own body. And from my perspective, with my ears, it all sounds pretty good. But a lot like with production sound, you might think you're on a really quiet set, but you're actually recording all of these other noises because of the pressure that the microphone capsule is getting from the environment. So it's the same thing with Foley. It's like the pats from my perspective might sound good and rich. It's like, Hey, can you try it? You know, like shifting your hand down like an inch or something. And then all of a sudden it's like, that's what lit it up for the microphone, which makes it translate better for the film. So it's a really collaborative kind of dance trying to create these sounds to fill it out. And then the irony is that most Foley sounds are very, very low in the mix. So we put in a lot of this detail, we put in all these footsteps, and then they, they occupy a small range of audible territory for the film. But it's the one thing that really, really drives this like, 
unknown kind of visceral texture for the film that makes people feel more connected and more, more kind of believable. En- enveloped. Yeah. And yeah. believable, a believable world because we hear all of these things and take them in all the time, but we have a natural tendency in our everyday lives to tune them out. Yeah. I was going to say, I've heard a number of re-recording mixers refer to Foley as the audible glue for the mm-hmm. film. Mm-hmm. It like, it's, if you were able to A, B, the sound of the film with and without Foley, it, it just adds this immediate, tangible life yeah. to your film. And once you do hear the difference, it's hard to go without Foley afterwards. Now, there's Foley, and then there's also kind of like the sound design, pulling sound effects from stock libraries, which is another option as well. Foley, a lot of times, is a little bit more expensive because it's a lot more labor-intensive. I've had projects that we were like, look, we don't have the budget for Foley. We're going to do everything out of the canned or, if you will, canned or um, packages that are out there. Those are options as well that you guys do, right? Yes. So the majority of majority of film mixes contain both, a bit of both. Mm-hmm. And we might have some projects that have a lot of Foley and kind of an average amount of what we call hard effects or cut effects, things from libraries. But then there are other films where you take like action films, for example, the majority of the sounds in the film will be cut in from library or from stock. And then you're using Foley for the really kind of nuanced things. Mm -hmm. So even let's say like on a really strapped budget, even if it's more convenient to have a library to cut from, often it can end up being more efficient time-wise to Foley things because there's almost like a pre-editing that happens during the performance where I'm giving the film what it needs in a given moment and that's tailored to it. And then all it needs is a little bit of additional editing in order to sell it. And especially when you look at kind of more nuanced actions, like maybe somebody writing or somebody kind of fiddling with a book and opening it and closing it or newspaper is kind of a classic one, like somebody opening up a newspaper and kind of looking through it. All of those little movements can be, kind of a square peg round hole situation when you're editing from a library. Right. And with Foley, it's just, again, you're recording the natural tendency of physical objects and that kind of, that kind of mini chaos that happens with those physical objects is the thing that brings life to it. So sound effects libraries are incredibly crucial. I think getting ones that sound natural and aren't overused too much are great. And especially in the independent world, talking about indie films, there's an amazing amount of independent sound effects libraries out there where they're more cost effective. They're made by independent sound recordists and sound effects recordists. And they have that kind of independent spirit in mind where they maybe have a little bit less of a commercial sound to them than, than your really big libraries that may have been used in like 50 productions or more in one year. So um, it's all incredibly crucial content, you know, including those big box libraries, but it's kind of knowing knowing where they all fit together. And ideally you're in a situation where you use everything at your disposal. So you're using these amazing libraries on top of independent stuff on top of Foley. And then you create this big world. Right. When I, when I'm in in session, a lot of times I'm doing, we're doing a spotting session with my sound designer. He's I'm like, Oh, well we're just going to use canned for that door shut because we don't need to Foley that, but we do need to Foley, these footsteps because they're over ground that's kind of weird and, and unique. So we're going to Foley that. So they pick and choose what they're going to yeah. work on. And then sometimes they'll do both. They'll do a Foley and then they'll maybe mix in a hard effect on top of it just to kind of create a better sound. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to bring up specifically with mentioning doors is that the majority of stuff that does get cut in for independent film a lot of the time are things like doors cars, bigger items where you have a lot kind of at your disposal and maybe the benefit of having a Foley door isn't that much of a, you know, the benefit of it isn't that much of a stretch because it's, it may end up sounding very, very similar to something like that. It's a door. It's a door. door. And that's why you do hear, like, I remember, I think it was the first Hunger Games film. There's a very famous door that's been used in a lot of productions, you know, in the beginning of the film. And that was probably the consensus is like, we just need a good sounding door for her to walk through. Like it doesn't need to be, you know, this, that we didn't fly in some like rare mahogany or something. Door, but do it. it's, right? like, it's like, no, it's a door. That's perfect. Yeah. What is that one guy's yell? That's in every movie. What's the name of that? 
Oh, that one guy. You know who yeah. I'm talking about, right? I, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the Wilhelm scream. Wilhelm scream. Yeah. Thank you. The Wilhelm scream. It's 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 turned into Where's Waldo for me because I listened to every – I mean, it was in Avengers Infinity War. I sure, literally yeah. just heard it in Avengers Infinity Same. War. Why is that yell everywhere? Is it just something that now sound guys have to use? Like it's like it's like a, a they have to put it in because it's this running joke. Is it that good? Well, well, we're it's funny. We're actually at a really fun time to be talking about that because I think we've almost come full circle into like now people are are like. Maybe officially sick of it. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm <laughs> never going to get sick of it. But, I love but like, it. I personally love it. I wanted to know my movies. <laughs> I, I've heard. I can't remember who it was, but I feel like it was some of the guys at Skywalker were talking about a new scream that they discovered or recorded that is kind of a successor to to the Wilhelm. And I'm, of course, all ears about that because I'm like, it's a tall order. You know, it's well, been like waving the flag for years. But it's the Wilhelm was was can, a can you scream. Explain, yeah. Can you explain a little yeah. bit what it is? So, you know, it's this scream that the easiest place to find it a lot of the time are Star Wars movies, Indiana Jones movies, the kind of Lucasfilm empire of films, which was, you know, has been attributed to amazing veteran sound designer Ben Burt, Mm -hmm. who who was archiving sound effects as a student, I believe, and discovered the sound and went on. You know, for years, I think it was starting to get used in things. And so people started to realize this. And then this big research kind of process started for him. And Ann Krober was involved as well. Um, David Lynch's sound effects recordist, she's known for. So it really became kind of this cult following. And I think it was a very inter-industry thing that I think that the sound designers got, you know, is this like rite of passage or this kind of... um, you know, it's like who gets to break the wishbone at Thanksgiving and it's right. like who, get, who gets to cut the Wilhelm into the film, you know? Yeah. And sure. so and where is it going to be? You know, can we use it more than once? Can we be that like cheeky about I've it? Never but then, see, I've never seen it more than once. I generally only see it once in a movie because it's so distinctive. Yeah. But you find that people have gotten very creative about it. And I think what's happened is because of YouTube, because of the Internet. One of the my favorite things that I show students whenever I work with them is there's the compilations on YouTube. Yeah, of like I've seen all, them. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you know, 150 uses. And it's a great film history, too, because you can see all these incredible films. But what's happened is because people are now so aware of it is that people as sound designers have had to get really creative about how to incorporate it. Like there's an amazing use of it in Tron Legacy, mm-hmm. which is a really like bit crushed, digital sounding, stretched out thing. And it's so people have gotten very creative with it. What's funny about you mentioning, I think we were, my wife and I were watching Age of Ultron or yeah. maybe it was Infinity War and I didn't notice it and she did. <laughs> and for years I would be the one calling out, you know, sound facts during films and she was getting annoyed with me. And as, I, as, so, as, nor- as normal people would, sir. I'm yeah, sorry. Exactly. As normal and, people would. And normal people, yeah. And and at some point that kind of crossed over where she started calling things out to me like the Wilhelm and I'm like yeah I heard it I heard it oh my wife so. my, my 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 wife pulls out bad green screen comps now in yeah. in, in yeah. like big budget movies she's like oh that was a horrible green screen I'm like you're yeah. a social worker what do you do <laughs> <laughs> and she's like I've been with you for a long time I've picked up a couple of things <laughs> you know that's that's what's uh, I think that's a great message though to you know especially to these massive high budget films it's like people are smart uh, your average person now is so much oh, more yeah. aware oh, yeah. of the how the sausage is getting made that like you it's like oh wow now we've got to like catch up you know whereas it didn't used to be that people used to have really visceral reactions to seeing creature prosthetics or whatever oh. and it, it's now uh, very different the kind of stakes have been up a little bit but go back and watch hulk ang lee's hulk from 2000 and something <laughs> oh my god that's ilm is yeah. some of the worst CG I've ever seen in my <laughs> whole I remember, life. I remember some people saying that at the time, but it was kind of like, you know, bad compared to what or like, you know, whatever. Right. It's like, yeah, it's oh, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> All right, so let's let's get into the fun part of audio deliverables. <laughs> now, this is this is an absolute mystery to most filmmakers. Uh because tr- after being a post supervisor for so many years, most of them don't even understand deliverables of what, how important they are and what you need to do to get them. So can you explain what audio deliverables, at least filmmakers need when they're going to deliver a film domestically? Yeah. So 
It ranges, to say first, but on average, the majority of independent filmmakers that we work with need kind of a set set of deliverables. They usually get a 5.1 mix of their film, which is typically a wave file. Sure. They get a stereo down mix of that 5.1 mix, and then they typically get as-is stems. So as-is dialogue, music, and effects stems, or an as-is music and effects stem. And do you, um, you give stems for the 5.1 as well, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Now, now early on, so if there's, let's say, a distribution deal isn't lined up, but they need to kind of pre-prepare some stuff to approach the distribution company, or they need to create a trailer, typically it'll be, we'll, we'll say, okay, let's hold off on striking all of these things mm-hmm. until until we know a little bit more so that we can be be precise with what we're making. So to start, we might just be making... Just for the stereo version, we might be creating the as is DME or as is M&E mm-hmm. um, for use in trailer cutting or for use in submissions or whatever else. And then from there, start getting into the more kind of nitty gritty distribution deliverables. And so what happens a lot of the time in independent films that don't have a distribution deal lined up is that the next stop after their mix quite often is festivals. And so the goal a lot of the time is to get the festival mix done and completed. And then quite often a DCP is made. So for the DCP, you need your 5.1 and your stereo. The additional file that I should mention that we also provide is the um, Dolby Digital AC3. I I was about to ask you about that one. Yeah, that's a, that's a a wonderful little scam Dolby has. (laughs) (laughs) You got to rent that damn system. You got to rent that piece of gear to to encode it. And then you got to rent that another piece of gear to decode it. Like, what a scam. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thankfully, you know, the AC3 is at least like a, you know, creating something like a DCP or a Dolby print master for where, when you're going into like more intense distribution deliverables. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, the AC3 is kind of the lesser of all of those kind of cost deliverables because oh, yeah. I think of, of its flexibility, the fact that it's, it's a format that was able to live on both DVD and Blu-ray which I think is pretty incredible. And and HDSRs as well. Yeah, sure, sure. So it's, um, we we always provide one of those in case there's going to be a screener or anything that might need to be created on physical media. But it's definitely like now, people submitting to festivals even as large as TIFF, uh, Toronto International Film Festival, they're going to be using digital upload. So, you know, in most cases, that's, stereo if not all cases you mean for uh, for um for screeners uh yeah, yeah. for submissions yeah submissions yeah so it's all on a vim it's a vimeo yeah. link it's a vimeo yeah. link and that generally is stereo you're right you would not want to jam in a 5-1 mix on a quick time yeah and so that actually helps in a lot of ways because that's the big difference overall between a um a stereo mix and a 5-1 mix is your dialogue coverage mm-hmm. because as soon as you start splitting things out across the surround channels you become much more aware of noise and kind of the things you need to do to fill out the environment surrounding the dialogue. And with stereo that you have a little bit more leeway on that because it spreads across the two channels. So especially when you're delivering to a festival and typically delivering early on in the post-production process, a lot of mixes that we do within the first two or three weeks, there might be, we're in the middle of that right now. We just started a film and we need to deliver a submission mix for it. Mm -hmm. So quite often that ends up having to be stereo for that. So it's, it's all, I think finally gelled together and become a more convenient process. Now, now can you discuss a little bit about international deliverables? Like what a fully filled M and E is, because I know that's, that's something that sneaks up on people like, Oh, wait a minute. What? Cause that's expensive. That's not cheap to do a fully filled M and E. Yeah, exactly. So as I mentioned with the kind of previous basic domestic deliverables, I kept on saying the term as is, Mm -hmm. And as is, is the alternate to fully filled. So as is, is based on maybe it's a lower budget, or maybe it's the fact that we're not sure what kind of distribution deal we're going to get. You might not be in a position where you need to fill in all the sounds that were behind dialogue in the dialogue track. And that can be any, you know, all the incidental sounds that might be picked up on set, not fully sounds, not things added, but somebody's walking and talking and you can hear their bag rustling and their footsteps clearly behind dialogue. Well, if you're only ever going to go domestic and you're going to have a very low level distribution deal, 
that stuff can stay there and it's going to do its job. But as soon as you get rid of that dialogue, you're going to be missing all of those effects that were recorded behind it on set. And so with a fully filled, we'll call it a fully filled DME, dialogue, music and effects stem, you have to be able to mute the dialogue track and then your effects track contain all of the same information that was behind the dialogue so that you're not having dropouts so that you can replace, you can overdub in any other language and it will more or less sound like the same film, you know, outside of the language being spoken to the actors that are hired to do that. And that's not, that's not cheap. That's, that's an expensive process to go. And, and that is a cost that gets snuck up on. If, if you don't have a good post supervisor on the filmmaker, they're like, what do you mean? I need another five grand. What do you need yeah. another 10 grand to do this? I'm like, well, that's what it's going to cost. Uh, yeah. cause you, your movie was not in good shape. <laughs> yep. You hit the nail on the head. And in a lot of ways, at least the way we have our templates set up, even if we're working towards an as is set of deliverables, we are prepping in such a way that once we do get the green light to go fully filled, we've already kind of started in that direction. So it, it's not like we have to break up the original as is mix and start anew. We've laid the groundwork to pursue a fully filled M and E mix. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. We have to do in a lot of cases, full footsteps coverage, a Russell pass. So the sound of the close of the characters throughout mm-hmm. the entire film. Yeah. It's, um, it's, and it's the generic rustling of, everybody on the screen so we'll shoot that front to back for the entire film so that there's always some kind of support for characters that are on screen and i think what's what's interesting about the fully filled is that there's at least kind of two ways to think about what the effects end up sounding like there's kind of what i consider like the indiana jones trade-off where you want to replace the content that's behind dialogue from production with something of an equal value or weight Mm -hmm. so that you're doing that trade and that no discernible value has been lost from the effects. But then there are some cases where, because of the necessity to have to fill back in all this stuff, you may be technically improving the sound quality of some of these effects elements because you're having to replace them. Sure. So in some cases, your foreign dubbed version of the film will have a slightly different texture with it, it may sound like a slightly higher fidelity in some specific circumstances because you're no longer leaning on on the more raw, kind of natural sounding production sound that used to be there. Now, can we talk a little bit about what's on the horizon for deliverables and sound? Because they're always, you know, five one, seven one, and you know, Atmos. You know, are you guys delivering Atmos right now? Are you guys doing seven one? Can you talk a little bit about those things? And what else that I, I didn't mention, if there's anything else on the horizon? Yeah, there are some newer things that are still in development. But yeah, to kind of go back to surround formats, 5.1 and 7.1 are still very much the standard. You would call it the new standard in a lot of ways versus stereo or whatever. Now that's 5.1 especially is very much considered the standard. Mm -hmm. And then 7.1 is often used as well. Atmos isn't being done yet on that much of an indie level no it's only for um, theatrical um, until yeah. we until we get more of an atmos home theater experience yeah but even Which, then it, how many indie it, films really need atmos right exactly i mean you can argue that the big argument for atmos is that it's just a little bit more space to breathe to, mm-hmm. to kind of move things around but you can easily think about that in relation to five one as well and ask yourself how many people you know that have proper five one systems or five one soundbar setups at their house and then Think about from a consumer purchase level, how something like an Atmos mix for the home consumer isn't getting used as much as it could be. Now, there are a lot of companies are now coming out with Atmos speakers for home. And of course, they figured out how to do it in a soundbar. So you don't need to have this Mm -hmm. big elaborate setup to do it. I mean, that's great that they're able to take this big format and do that. But from an indie perspective, it's about, okay, we, you know, we have vastly more channels available to push the sound wherever we want to. But that takes time to do. And if there are no audiences that are going to get the benefit of hearing that, then what's the point? They, yeah, it's that's it. Yeah. What, what's the point? Because essentially the directors and producers that are on the dub stage getting to hear the final mix are going to hear it the best then. And then if they don't get the opportunity to screen it in an Atmos theater or screen it for a lot of people, when it's streaming or whatever in home scenarios, then it didn't live beyond the mix stage. So 
it's really about thinking about where your film's going to play, mm-hmm. um, right. who the audience is going to be, and tailoring it for them. So as much as Atmos is absolutely amazing, which it is, it's also like it's still very much in that growth phase of like, okay, who's who's the intended audience? Should we just all agree that it's going to stay yeah. in theaters, or is it? Are we going to start to see it pop up more at people's homes? I mean, yeah, that, uh, go ahead, Rich. I was going to say that being said, there have been significant jumps across the decades in terms of like your final deliverable format. So the Mm -hmm. jump from mono to stereo, it was like, Oh, we instantly know that that is much better. So we're going to go stereo. And the same could be said from stereo to five one. The difference there is just, you instantly know now the jump from five one to seven one in some ways wasn't quite as significant as the jump from stereo to five one. And what I've, what I've heard in reading up on, on Atmos and listening to other professionals talk about it is that the jump from five one to Atmos is another one of those significant jumps. It, it so is. It, I've, it, I've it, had, I've had the experience of being in both mixes. Yeah. It's amazing. And I have heard the rumblings that Netflix in certain cases might be requiring Atmos deliverables as part of their deliverable requirements. So it could be creeping up in the next couple of years. We'll see. So one thing, one thing that Rich mentioned was the jump from mono to stereo. And there's actually, I think a pretty famous story with, I hope I'm getting this right. I think it was with Scorsese Mm -hmm. where he was getting to hear one of the first filmmakers that, you know, got to hear this jump to stereo. And I believe he hated it Um, (laughs) because he was like, I don't understand. I'm seeing my characters in the middle of the screen and I'm hearing them to the left and the right and they're losing their they're losing their anchor. They don't feel physical anymore. This is awful. Go back to mono. And the kind of amazing thing about five one is that it brought back and embraced fully the idea of mono while also like transforming it into this amazing new soundscape. It's like a full proper evolution. You get kind of the best of both, but now, so, so like, you know, there's Atmos, but one of the other pretty new horizon for sound has been because of VR and 360 sound work, which is still the wild west right now in terms of everybody from technology manufacturers to filmmakers, sound people are all still trying to figure out how it's all working, how to optimize it, how to collaborate. It's a very open collaborative industry right now for that because um, people just want to figure it out to make it work. And it's interesting because binaural has had a massive comeback because of 360 and VR sound design because it's binaural is just, it's just stereo, but it's an immersive kind of stereo recording technique and playback where it really holds the audience in a space. And thanks to kind of VR filmmaking and, and stuff like that, it's come back in a big way because it's so much more attainable to record in that than it is to record ambisonics or, or any of these advanced formats, but talking about deliverables, that's on a whole other level because of the, the files that you need to deliver oh, need to contain yeah. metadata that link. And mm-hmm, at mm-hmm. the time when I was experimenting with VR last year, the year before it was a YouTube wasn't even equipped to handle certain things. And you couldn't, you know, it was like YouTube on an Android phone in that combination could handle, yeah. you know, a certain kind of file. And so slowly it's now we're at a point where the default, I think vanilla copy of Pro Tools comes with Facebook 360 audio <laughs> implementation and stuff like that. So we're definitely getting there, but it's like that's kind of the wild west right now of, of audio. So can you guys tell me a little bit about Studio Known? Sure. So um, Studio Known is a bicoastal audio post production facility, and we're a full service facility. So we do all editorial, you know, dialogue editorial, sound effects editorial, music editing. Obviously, we do Foley art, Foley recording and editing. And then we have a um, 5.1 Dolby tuned and approved dub stage, at least on our in one of our facilities. We have because we're bi-coastal, we have facilities in Los Angeles as well, Hollywood and Burbank. So, you know, in our facility located where we are right now, which is just out of Baltimore, Maryland, we have a full service facility with our Foley stage, dubbing stage, editorial suites and everything. So. Our studio, being by coastal, has great workflows to be able to work with filmmakers just about anywhere, actors on both coasts if they need to come in for ADR, 
and pipelines between them to really make it an efficient creative process. And so it's a film focused facility, um, okay. film focused company, but we do anything audio. So we've done interactive work. We've done VR work. Sure. We do commercials and spots. But really the big thing about the work that we do is we always see creative opportunities within it. So just because we're given a talking head documentary, that doesn't mean that it has to be flat or just be dialogue, just be music. It's opportunities to figure out how you can be creative and still still give the audience an experience uh, regardless of the specific genre or type of work that it is. So like putting explosions in the background of a talking head. <laughs> yeah, like Michael Baying it. Michael Baying it. Yeah, if it, if it calls for it. I think uh, another big point to highlight, and I'm seeing this in a lot of companies even beyond audio post, is that we have our core full-time team whether we're talking about Baltimore or LA, but we also have an extensive list of freelance editors that might sure. specialize in dialogue, specialize in sound design, specialize in, yeah. you know, various forms of editorial. So we find that we're able to scale the team to match whatever the project needs. Right. If it's a talking head documentary, we might be able to keep it all in house. If it's a Netflix original, we might be calling upon some of our friends to come join our team for that particular project. Yeah, or very even cool. if yeah, it's, and you guys, an, yeah, and you guys are very indie film friendly. For sure. We, yeah, I mean that's you know we've done stuff that's been on primetime broadcast, and we've done stuff that's been very commercial and stuff like that. But our big focus and the majority of the film work that we do is independent. And there's an independent nature, I think, to even the kind of larger broadcast things we've done. I think it's more of kind of a mindset in some ways. But yeah, we're extremely indie film focused. And I think the important part about what makes us like that is the fact that we understand the problems and the challenges and hurdles that can come up during the production process and how you need to creatively problem solve in order to make it successful. We know that budgets are what they are in the indie film world. And so budget's always a conversation at any level as to what your priorities are, like what we need to focus on. How can we help you do your film in a way that you don't feel like trapped in the process? It's like we creatively, Very cool. you know, other people. So, well, I'm going to do the speed round now of all the questions I ask all my guests. So we're going to knock these out quick. I wanted to ask you, first of all, what advice would you give any filmmakers trying to break into the business today? I, I think it's really important to ask questions and to be a sponge. And I think that's really important at the beginning of your career in in this case with filmmakers, sound people, whoever it is, be a sponge and be willing to learn from everybody and never stop. Anybody that stops the learning process because they think that they have enough experience is doing themselves a disservice because it's an opportunity to build peers and collaborators and improve yourself and help other people improve themselves. And it's a great resource and personality trait to have early on because it will give you opportunities to excel faster where in whatever category you're trying to do within filmmaking, it's just a, it's trying to feed back in and build relationships. It's Mm -hmm. just so building relationships and being, being social and building your network is valuable. Yeah. I think that's kind of more where my immediate reaction went to with the question is maybe more so in a practical sense is seek out internships, understand that Mm -hmm. there's a, a large need for freelance editors out there. So if you're going to call various companies, maybe don't ask, are you hiring a full-time position? Say more so, do you need help with your night shift crew? Or are you seeking freelance editors in this capacity at all? Cause, sure, cause sure. I'm around. All right, cool. Now, yeah. can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? <laughs> you were talking about this one earlier. Yeah. Um, Dr. Seuss, got it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think for me, I can pinpoint a couple throughout my life, but it's, you know, any of the books where the story has gripped me so much where I'm reading it till three in the morning on a school night. And most recently in my life, uh, I like a lot of sci-fi and I, this one's been around forever, but the last one I devoured was Dune. Yes. So I just, I crushed that book. Very quickly. And I think uh, Denny Bellinu, am I saying his last name right? I hope I am. Last I heard, he's actually rebooting it. There's Vilner? 
Yeah. What's that? Yeah, they yeah. are. Dennis Villeneuve. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the guy that did Arrival. And Blade Runner. Blade Runner 2049, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would so be, I, he would be a good guy for that. He'll be a good guy to reboot that. To reboot yeah, that. for sure. Yeah. Well, that's just last I read. Hopefully it, it comes to, but yeah. It's a tough yeah, book. Think, it's a tough book to bring to the movie, to screen. Yeah. I think to give kind of a general answer to that, I love reading material that is descriptive and immersive because that's the same content that I look for in films is descriptive texture to the film. And so a lot of the stuff that I read for the most part now is scripts. It's based on assessing films for the creative process and much like books they have a style to them they have a way of being written and some you find don't use a lot of adjectives don't do a lot of describing to set the tone for a scene so when you're reading that you're having to put a lot into trying to understand the world that the author is creating versus one that might have a more collaborative style of being written where they're very descriptive of the visual environment and then, therefore, you start to, in your head, hear the environments and things like that. They have specific adjectives being used to describe a creaky staircase and so, everything. So a good, so good writing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, really good writing. Yeah. Um, I mean, the same thing extends to poetry. You know what I mean? Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Now, what lesson uh, took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? I think for me, it's similar to what we were talking about with starting in the film industry. I think that all the technical stuff is a matter of time for the most part. It's like after a while, you know, rinsing and repeating, you'll learn how to operate. You'll learn how to do this. But the creative side of things can be much harder to learn in terms of your ideas. And one of the biggest ways that you develop, I think, creatively is by having a creative mind or training yourself to be creative. And that starts with questions. It starts with being curious. And I think that I became a better, you know, better in general, but better certainly as a sound designer with the more questions I started asking. Not assuming that your idea or the ideas that you have are the best ideas in it because you're being hired as the sound person, that obviously your ideas are the best out of everybody's in the rooms. It's about asking questions of other people. And like one of the biggest questions I ask in every spotting session that I have with filmmakers is how do you want the audience to feel in the scene? And in a lot of ways, it takes the pressure off of everybody because it's thinking about, oh yeah, they're the end user. They're the right, people right. That, that matter the most because they're going to make or break your career, whether they like your content or not. And so it's really that I think asking questions can be so important to do that. And I, I really like, I try to ask as many questions as I can as possible. Like even things that might seem obvious, like that whole, like there, you know, there are no stupid questions. There really aren't. It's like some of the information might be redundant, but right. it's all information that'll help you be, you know, better filmmaker, better sound person, better person, human person. The very first thing Matt just said, referring to a lot of the times the tech will come with time. It kind of applies more to your question about advice when you're first breaking mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that a lot of times like the interns that come through and just various people that we choose to work with, at least initially, a lot of times it can be more personality driven. How do you work with the team? I can teach anybody the tech just about, but it's much more difficult to teach someone to have an agreeable personality or just someone that you want to yes. be around yes. every single day. So if you see certain struggles within your own life, as far as becoming one of those agreeable personalities, uh, I'd start there. Yeah, and it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a tall order. But <laughs> so, so, so just don't be a dick. Don't be a yeah, dick. It's exactly. basically the best advice you can give people. Yeah, I, I think it's really hard with the film industry, especially too, because it is 50 50 creative and technical. Sure. And when you have that, you're going to have a much larger mixed bag of people that are either very technically minded and literal and people that are very abstract and quote unquote creative artsy. And so there can be certainly a struggle with that if you're too much of one thing versus the other. And yep. you find that most people that are well-rounded and successful, it doesn't mean that they're not as creative as somebody who's a purely creative artsy person. It just means that they've learned the language to be able to talk to anybody about it. And that's, oh God, that's one thing with talking to some independent filmmakers. They go, I don't know if I'm going to use the right words 
So correct me if I'm not making sense or tell me if something doesn't make sense. And mm -hmm. I don't speak the language. And I said, it's, I always say, it's not your job to know the language. It's my job to interpret what you're saying and figure out these ideas that you have because you do have them. They're in there. It's just a matter of like learning to communicate them and, and having people around you that are willing to ask and learn. So lastly, guys, each of you give me one of your favorite films of all time. Oh boy. That's a lot easier. My biggest influence probably has been Alien. That's a great uh, movie. Great, great movie. Yeah, and it's I think it's my de facto desert island film because, you know, I, I think I saw it first when I was 10. But Not a good uh, idea, but go ahead. Not, not a good idea, <laughs> but, but years before I had seen it, I was living in the UK. I grew up in England, and we didn't have a lot of the same action figures that were being produced in the States. It took months for things to come overseas for us. And so I remember my grandmother sending me one of the Kenner action figures from, from aliens. That was the most That's incredible crazy, that they had those things. <laughs> crazy looking thing that it was a flying alien queen, which does not exist in the film universe at all. Of course. But is this just monstrosity and it's incredible. And I remember being like, oh my God, this is just on a whole other level. And I got obsessed with the just the visual of the figures and then eventually got into the art and the comic books before I was allowed to see the films. And then finally, was, I remember this right after we moved to the States, the film was on AMC. I think it was back when they oh, just so you saw it. So you, cut, you saw a cut down version of it. I saw a cut down version, but uh, still. but it stuck with me forever. And every, every different part of my life, that film has meant something different. Like in high school, I got hardcore into Geiger's uh, sure. art for the film. And then eventually... I started getting more into the sound design for the film and then back into the sculpture. And it's just, it's such a landmark piece Very and cool. it's amazing. And now it's like, I get more obsessed about the score than just about anything in the film. So. <laughs> How about you, Rich? Oh boy. Let's see. I won't hold you to it. It won't be on your, on your tombstone. Just something that comes to mind. Well, I guess if I had to base it off of what I've gone back and rewatched, the most. I don't know why I'm using that as a, a way yeah, to no. measure it, but, mm -hmm. but I'd say maybe the Lord of the Rings series. Okay. Yeah, and just it's got a pretty much a little bit of everything across you know the full span of nine hours that that series runs. <laughs> that's that's um, the original. I think the, the, uh, the extended one's like eleven hours. Oh my goodness! <laughs> but you know everything from very intimate, more sure, dramatic sure. sections through some of the most creative creature design. Very cool. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for being on uh, on the show. It's been an epic, epic conversation about sound. And I think anyone listening to this episode will be a lot better versed in sound and what they're going to need to get good sound and deliverables and all that kind of good stuff. So thank you for dropping some knowledge bombs on the on the tribe today. And I'll put links to how to get to you in the show notes. So don't worry about that. So thank you, guys. Yeah, You're right welcome. On. My pleasure. As promised, Matt and Rich brought the thunder and really dropped a bunch of knowledge bombs on the tribe today in regards to audio. And I cannot tell you how important audio is, guys. I mean, one of the reasons we were able to sell This Is Meg is because the audio was done very, very well, even though I was recording it mostly with a, a little Tascam and a, and a Rode mic uh, on how I put it together. But the, an audio post, we were able to put it together, give it depth really give a lot more production value to scenes that were mostly in in rooms but we were able to give much more uh value to it and that's the power of audio if you intend to sell a movie in today's marketplace you need to have stellar audio and again the boys over at studio known can definitely help you i'll leave all their links in the show notes and a special deal that uh, you get by uh, mentioning Indie Film Hustle. So just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 247 for the show notes. And if you haven't, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave us a good review on iTunes. It would really help us out a lot. Five stars would be amazing. Thank you. Again, it really helps get the word out on what we're trying to do at Indie Film Hustle and get this information and this knowledge to as many filmmakers as possible. And that's it for today, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.